Anatomy is the study of the structure of living organisms and their parts. It examines the physical form and organization of the body, including organs, tissues, and cells. Physiology is the study of the functions of living organisms and their parts. It explores how the body works, including the chemical and physical processes involved in maintaining life. Now listen to a part of a talk in an anatomy class. Now, human anatomy is the scientific study of the body's structures. Some of these structures are very small and can only be observed and analyzed with the assistance of a microscope. Other larger structures can readily be seen, manipulated, measured, and weighed. The word anatomy comes from a Greek root that means to cut apart. Human anatomy was first studied by observing the exterior of the body and observing the wounds of soldiers and other injuries. But later, physicians were allowed to dissect bodies of the dead to augment their knowledge. Now, when a body is dissected, its structures are cut apart in order to observe their physical attributes and their relationships to one another. Dissection is still used in medical schools, anatomy courses, and in pathology labs. Question. What is the lecture mainly about? Why does the professor mention the Greek root of the word anatomy? Now listen to a part of a talk in an anatomy class. Human movement includes not only actions at the joints of the body, but also the motion of individual organs and even individual cells. As you read these words, red and white blood cells are moving throughout your body, muscle cells are contracting and relaxing to maintain your posture and to focus your vision, and glands are secreting chemicals to regulate body functions. Your body is coordinating the action of entire muscle groups to enable you to move air into and out of your lungs, to push blood throughout your body, and to propel the food you've eaten through your digestive tract. Now, conscientiously, of course, you contract your skeletal muscles to move the bones of your skeleton to get from one place to another and to carry out all of the activities of your daily life. Question. What actions of human movement are made consciously? What does the lecturer imply when she says this? As you read these words, red and white blood cells are moving throughout your body, muscle cells are contracting and relaxing to maintain your posture and to focus your vision, and glands are secreting chemicals to regulate body functions. Now listen to a part of a talk in an anatomy class. Now, the position of the heart in the chest allows for individuals to apply an emergency technique known as cardiopulmonary resuscitation, commonly referred to as CPR, if the heart of a patient should stop. By applying pressure with the flat portion of one hand on the sternum, it is possible to manually compress the blood within the heart enough to push some of the blood within it into the major arteries. Now, this is particularly critical for the brain, as irreversible damage and death of neurons occur within minutes of loss of blood flow. Current standards call for a compression of the chest at least 5 centimeters deep and at a rate of 100 compressions per minute. At this stage, the emphasis is on performing high-quality chest compressions rather than providing artificial respiration. CPR is generally performed until the patient regains heart activity or is declared dead by an experienced healthcare professional. Now, when performed by untrained individuals, CPR can result in broken ribs and can inflict additional severe damage on the patient. It is also possible, if the hands are placed too low, to manually drive the xiphoid process into the liver, 
a consequence that may prove fatal for the patient. Now, proper training is essential. This proven life-sustaining technique is so valuable that virtually all medical personnel, as well as concerned members of the public, should be certified and routinely recertified in its application. Question. What does the professor imply about the utility of CPR training? What can happen if the hands are placed too low on the sternum when performing CPR? Now listen to a part of a talk in an anatomy class. Okay, so German physicist Wilhelm Röntgen, born in 1845, died in 1923, was experimenting with electrical current when he discovered that a mysterious and invisible ray would pass through his flesh but leave an outline of his bones on a screen coated with a metal compound. Then, in 1895, Röntgen made the first durable record of the internal parts of a living human, an X-ray image, as it came to be called, of his wife's hand. Scientists around the world quickly began their own experiments with X-rays, and by 1900, X-rays were widely used to detect a variety of injuries and diseases. Okay, so in 1901, Röntgen was awarded the first Nobel Prize for Physics for his work in this field. Now, the X-ray is a form of high-energy electromagnetic radiation with a short wavelength capable of penetrating solids and ionizing gases. As they are used in medicine, X-rays are emitted from an X-ray machine and directed toward a specifically treated metallic plate placed behind the patient's body. Now, the beam of radiation results in darkening of the X-ray plate. X-rays are slightly impeded by soft tissues, which show up as gray on the X-ray plate, whereas hard tissues, such as bone, largely block the rays, producing a light-toned shadow. Thus, X-rays are best used to visualize hard body structures, such as teeth and bones. Now, like many forms of high-energy radiation, however, X-rays are capable of damaging cells and initiating changes that can lead to cancer. This danger of excessive exposure to X-rays was not fully appreciated for many years after their widespread use. Question. What are X-rays best used for? Why does the professor say this? This danger of excessive exposure to X-rays was not fully appreciated for many years after their widespread use. Now listen to a part of a talk in an anatomy class. A human body consists of trillions of cells organized in a way that maintains distinct internal compartments. Now, these compartments keep body cells separated from external environmental threats and keep the cells moist and nourished. They also separate internal body fluids from the countless microorganisms that grow on body surfaces, including the lining of certain tracts or passageways. Now, the intestinal tract, for example, is home to even more bacteria cells than the total of all human cells in the body. Yet, these bacteria are outside the body and cannot be allowed to circulate freely inside the body. Cells, for example, have a cell membrane, also referred to as the plasma membrane, that keeps the intracellular environment, the fluids and organelles, separate from the extracellular environment. Blood vessels keep blood inside a closed circulatory system, and nerves and muscles are wrapped in connective tissue sheaths that separate them from surrounding structures. In the chest and abdomen, a variety of internal membranes keep major organs, such as the lungs, heart, and kidneys, separate from others. 
Question: What is the topic of this lecture? Why does the professor talk about the intestinal tract?